Good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market and Deli. This morning, special guest that we have with us is Laura Matter. She is one of the uh, uh, Garden Hotline Educators, and we are always so thrilled to have her with us and honored. And she is speaking on the topic of preparing for spring gardens. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And um, uh, thank you so much, Laura, and everyone at Garden Hotline. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> I had a um, cold like a, over two weeks ago, but I still have a little congestion from it. It was quite a bear of a cold, so bear with me. I may have to take some sips of water and get a little scratchy throat now and then when I'm talking a lot. Um, yes, I'm excited to be here. We're starting our series for the year. Um, we have topics that are going to be each month will be timely, sort of seasonal, but also um, include uh, information that's <clears throat> basic to gardening, but some specialty info with each one. Um, and today what we're talking about is how you prepare uh, to get into your garden in the spring. Sometimes that means you're waiting a little bit. Sometimes it means you're planning. Um, but we start generally by explaining um, why soil health is important because that's the first thing that most people do in the spring is get their soil together. So we're gonna go through a series of topics including soil health, planning and, pl and different tools for planning and then um, how to choose plants. And the first thing I got is a question for you. So if you want, you can put this in the chat box um, <clears throat> so that we have a record of it. So how much do you know about garden planning? And these are just simple answers, nothing at all. I've done some garden planning. I have a great deal of experience. Um, part of this is gauging who we're talking to. Uh, the Garden Hotline is a program that <laughs> is managed by Tilt Alliance. And we are um, uh, in Wallingford, our offices are in Wallingford. So we answer phone calls and emails and go out and do <clears throat> workshops. We also do talks like this um, all the time. And so we're talking to people with all different kinds of experience. And it's just helpful knowing kind of who, who's out there, who's interested and how we can help you. Um, we're funded through Seattle Public Utilities and the Hazardous Waste Management Program in King County. And so we're a King County wide program, which is great. So if you guys want to take a minute to answer that, and Elizabeth, if you can monitor the chat and see how we're doing there, we can move on when we're ready. How are we looking with the chats? Everybody get a chance to say something? We have several, let's see. I think most everyone has responded. I think we have six folks here. So that I see six chats. Perfect. Six messages. All right, I'm gonna move on. All right, so here's our outline. We're gonna learn about soil health for your plants, mulching beds in the spring, some of the best planning tools, ways to think about uh, planning for the year, how, how to choose plants for an edible garden, and how to choose plants for your landscape. And so rather than, we won't talk as much about specific varieties of things, um, which can, will come later as we move into the year and our talks, but this is about like, how do you make those choices? What is, what's the criteria you're looking at? Um, in this beautiful photo, you're seeing whole bunch of lettuces that somebody started um, in their spring garden. And um, you can see that there's a variety. There's like four different types here. So, you know, even just in the lettuce world, there's a huge variety of options for your garden. So soil is the key to plant health. We need our soil to drain well so that plants don't get waterlogged. Uh, soil has a mixture of organic matter and mineral content, but it also has 
air and water and then life in it. So some of the uh, different um, critters that live in the soil are crucial to helping feed your plants. So it's not always what we think. When we fertilize a plant, we think, oh, we're just feeding the plant directly. <clears throat> Organic fertilizers are actually slow release, they break down. And what's really feeding your plants is all the microorganisms, macroorganisms in the soil, because they're eating that content and then they're distributing that back out into the soil and to the plants. And in some cases, there are microorganisms that are um, fungal in the soil that or bacterial that actually interact with plant roots directly. And they are feeding the plant and in exchange, they get sugars from the back from, from the plants. So they provide a lot of the nutrients um, and it's their conversion that makes those available. So we wanna think about soil as habitat. It's very crucial to think about it that way because we're trying to protect all the life that's in the soil so that our plants can have this relationship. So over the years of growing in soil, it can become depleted of different nutrients. So it needs to be fed. There's multiple ways to do that. Um, you can add fertilizers and certainly in a vegetable garden, this is often a really good practice because we're talking about short lived plants in a um, captive setting where they're being grown year after year and the soil definitely gets depleted, but they're also um, very short lived. They're annual plants and they're very needy. So things like broccolis and cabbages and collards, for instance, big, huge green leaves, lots of photosynthesis going on in there, lots of photosynthetic um, cells. Uh, the, the deeper the green, the deeper the nitrogen, the more nitrogen. And so they need to be fed even more than uh, some other vegetables. So nitrogen feeding for those is a really good idea. But in general, what we're looking at is adding compost. This can even be in a in a bed, a garden bed, that's not um, a vegetable bed, but your shrub bed. So compost can be a good addition to the soil. Uh, you can grow cover crops as well in edible gardens when you're not growing food. And what you're looking at in this picture is uh, annual rye that was planted in fall. And this is very early spring and it's starting to grow. And that can get, you know, in a good year, it can get a half a foot to two feet tall, depending on the variety of what you you uh, sowed and also how the winter went and how warm the spring is. But this is content that eventually gets turned into the soil and um, becomes food uh, for microorganisms and the plants. So another thing that's important is to think about soil testing. Nutrient analysis and toxins are the two different um, things you're looking at. Uh, in King County, in most cities, there's a couple of cities that don't uh, participate in the King Conservation District. They don't uh, pay in as cities. And so most cities in King County, though, you can get a free nutrient analysis soil test from King Conservation District. This is a nonprofit that has funding that comes through all the cities through taxing and uh, their goal, their job is really to look at um, our native environments and our soils and um, originally were created, you know, to help farmers and ranchers, but they also work with homeowners and um, have this free, great free soil test. So you gather your soil, you send it to them, you can drop it off to, they're down in Renton, um, sort of near Ikea these days, down Rent, Renton, Kent area. And they will send you back a soil test that looks like this. And it's a little overwhelming to look at, but it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. We're looking at what kind of nutrients there are or are not. It shows what um, pH your soil is, which is how acid or alkaline it is. And that's important when you're growing different things like blueberries, rhododendrons, native shrubs, Northwest natives like acidic soils but most vegetable gardens do not. So having that information is helpful. And then it has a little fertility guidelines of how much you should be adding to your soil depending on what you told them you were growing. So for this instance, this is a vegetable garden. 
badge two is their sample ID. And you can put in there, you know, it's this is my rhododendron shrub bed, or this is my lawn, or this is my raised bed for vegetables, and they will give you guidance. You can also um, send that to us at the garden hotline through the email and uh, or and call us and we can talk through it um, and discuss what they found. If you're looking to test uh, toxins, King uh, Conservation District doesn't do that with the free testing, but you can pay a little extra and they will do some analysis for you. They look at things like lead in the soil, for instance. But Soil Test Farm Consultants has a whole uh, panel. So if you are working in an area that you are concerned about um, so some legacy pollution, so like for Federal Way area in particular, we think about the, um, the plume, the um, Asarco plume, um, from the smelter down there that was pumping out over 100 years of pollutants into the Puget Sound area. And that was a lot of heavy and lead, arsenic, and cadmium. And so those are things you want to know about in particular um, if you're growing food, but also even if you're working in it, you're stirring it up, you could be inhaling soil particles. Um, so there, there's a lot of information out there about that through the DIRT Alert program and the hotline can help you understand that better too. An AM test also has lots of different tests you can do for your soil. So when you're choosing soil for containers, this is a little bit easier to do because you can control what you're putting in it. There's a lot of different soil products out there. You wanna make sure it has good drainage. So you're not going to be looking for bagged soil that's just like topsoil dug up somewhere and put in a bag. You're looking for something that's been manufactured, created to become a, a media for plants to grow in. So the word soil here is relative because soil really is mineral content, organic matter, air, water, and all the little micronutrients that have, have you know, created an environment over years takes a long time for, for rocks to break down in the soil and create that mineral content. So soil in this context is, is we're really talking about growing medium. And typically you'll see different ingredients in here that are heavy in compost, um, could have things like vermiculite or perlite in them. And my favorite kind of blend has perlite rather than vermiculite, mostly because it drains better. And it, I think it has a little bit better mineral content for your soil. But you're looking for the word potting soil, which indicates that this is um, an appropriate product to use to put plants into. You can add compost or topsoil from your garden. Um, you want to, you know, you can blend those together if you want. You're just looking for a blend that is going to drain well because when you put things in pots, they become a little more compacted easily. And then the drainage will be a problem if you don't have a good uh, loose soil. You can mulch the surface of soil in a pot with compost. That helps to feed it a little bit. It also helps to keep it a little warmer. It insulates it and it keeps it a little cooler in the summertime and it keeps the moisture in. So those are all useful ways to um, use compost with pots. So when you're talking about garden beds, um, you know, the goal here is to condition your soil. And what pictures we're looking at, obviously, is a big pile of compost being shoveled into a wheelbarrow. So, you know, you can get, if you have a large yard, you can get compost dumped in bulk. And um, you could actually go in with your neighbors and all of you buy a big pile and then share it. Um, and then you spread it through the yard. Now, ideally, if you have a bed, you're trying to spread compost into you want to um, spread it through the whole bed and not just isolate it in pockets. And this is true when you're planting plants, that it's better not to just enrich a planting hole with compost and then not do anything to the areas around it because those roots are gonna grow out into the surrounding soil and they won't encounter as rich a soil. And sometimes that kind of stunts them. They don't, they prefer to stay in the soil that's more enriched and more loose and they will sometimes end up going around in circles, what's we, what we call girdling. Um, and that can affect plants, especially trees and shrubs. So in the fo photos here, you're looking at above too, this is a compost giveaway that um, we used to do with our group at Tilth Alliance um, every year. 
Um, uh, there's another nonprofit that's working on us now, ECOS, the Environmental Coalition of South Seattle. And this is a Seattle giveaway that happens annually um, for residents who have, you know, because we have been contributing to the organics uh, waste stream, they want to encourage people to keep doing that. And so they give free compost away to show what our waste, our food waste becomes. And in the bottom picture, we're looking at Gardner at Picardo Pea Patch, which was one of the original pea patches in the city of Seattle. Um, and he's busy turning his bed over um, in the spring. You can see how rich that soil is. That's very organic soil. It was an old peat bog. So there's not a lot of amendment that needs to happen in that kind of soil. So here's some ideas of products that you can find. So compost can be chicken manure strictly and may include the straw or whatever um, bedding was used for the chicken. It's very high in nitrogen. Um, so it, it can be a really good um, choice for when your soil has a low nitrogen profile. Um, black gold has a blend. Um, and then of course, Cedar Grove, which is coming from all our mun municipal and regional wastes. This is including um, food waste and yard waste. And one of the things I want you to want to point out here for you to see is the little label on each of these, it's in different places. So down here, we have the green Omri label. Up here, it's an orange one. Here, it's brown. The color doesn't matter. It's just to stand out on the product bag. But what this stands for is Organic Materials Review Institute. And this is a nonprofit that actually tests products um, and uh, guarantees that they are certified organic. So certified organic means that they have to meet a level of standards that meets the USDA organic standards. And this OMRI organization um, looks at products like this. You will see, um, you know, organic, um, certified organic stickers on other things that say USDA or WSDA. Uh, Oregon Tilth does some of the um, certifying for foods. And the, you know, so those are a little different. Those are agricultural organizations that will do this. These guys are looking at things like compost and soil. They're also looking at fertilizers and sprays that you might you know, want to spray if you have a pest in your garden. So the, if you go to their website, you can find lists, uh, links to lists of things that are certified organic to use in the garden. So um, mulch um, is a, just a product that you put on top of the soil. Um, it's literally right on the surface. It's not meant to be dug in. Compost can be a type of mulch, as I mentioned in the pots, but mulch has many, many benefits. This is a great time of year to be thinking about starting to mulch areas of your yard. I know it's still chilly out there, um, places you can get in and work. My backyard is um, a pond at the moment. We have a hillside that sort of seeps water, and then well, I'm in West Seattle near um, Longfellow Creek, and it's it doesn't drain really well. There's a lot of clay under the, under the lawn area. And so in the spring, I have a hard time even moving around back there. Um, I don't want to compact the soil too much. So I'm, I'm kind of getting the garden late in that part of the garden. Uh, but where you can, getting mulch out is a really good thing. Um, this time of year, of course, conserving more moisture is not our biggest concern, but it will be. And so getting ahead of that is helpful because now once you top it with mulch and there's going to be less evaporation from the soil. Um, it can help prevent weeds though. And this is the biggest reason to do it right now. This is the time of year that we have a million different little weeds, little annual weeds that have billions of little seeds that they spread everywhere. In particular, the little cresses that we see, they call them shotweed. There's different na names for them, but cardamony is the Latin name for those, those guys spread wheat or seeds like crazy. And so you'll get, you know, hundreds more from one little plant um, all, all over your garden. And they're very easy to pull, but you can prevent them. So you don't have to do that work. However, if you do get to the point where you have to pull some, this little shot weed um, that I'm talking about, cardamony, is also edible. It's in the um, cress family, which is related to broccoli and cabbage and all those things. So a lot of people eat them um, on purpose. 
And there are bigger versions of crust that people grow on purpose that are, you know, been uh, cultivated uh, to have in a garden. Um, the other thing mulch does, it moderates the soil temperature. So in, in the wintertime, it'll keep the soil warmer for the plant roots. It'll keep it cooler in the summer when it gets hot. And so that's a really important function. It can make your garden look very finished and it will look different depending on what kind of mulch you use. You kind of see in this picture, there's some different wood chips here, um, different um, types of wood chips. So the ones she's spreading around the uh, plant there are different than the ones that um, are being um, in the pathway below. They're, they're a little stringier. You could have straw, a bunch of other things. Um, and we're gonna look at a picture of some of different types of mulch in a sec. But another really great function of mulch is that it creates habitat for beneficial insects and birds. So there's a lot of critters that are ground, a lot of birds that are ground feeders and they'll kick through the mulch looking for insects. And then there's a lot of insects that live in the mulch. And a lot of these are beneficial. So things like the um, black beetle will come out and eat baby slugs and slug eggs, but they like this kind of habitat to hide in. It's, it's their safety zone. And um, it's important to have areas around the garden that have protection for them. So here's some ideas of different types of mulch. You can see straw and we, we um, mention organic straw on purpose. You can ask when you buy it um, if it if the uh, straw had been treated with anything. Um, when, they, when you get straw, you're getting um, the remains of a cereal crop, of some sort of grain usually. It's the shaft of the plant, of the grass plant. And uh, sometimes they're in conventional agriculture, they can be sprayed down, you know, to harvest. Um, and then that leaves contamination of herbicides on the straw and then you put it in your garden and it can leach into the soil. So that can be problematic. Leaves are a free resource in most people's yards or your neighbor's yards. Um, we really try to encourage people to think about, you know, looking around the neighborhood, be, <clears throat> who you're friends with and sharing leaves with each other. Um, <clears throat> it's useful to have them and some people don't have trees. Um, but leaves provide that cover for the beneficial insects and for the birds to kick in. They also have lots of great nutrients as they break down. Um, they're already there. You don't have to go looking for them. You can just spread them around. If you have too many in one place, you can move them around. You can bag them up and save them and use them again in the spring. You can shred them, um, compost them. Leaf mold is really a wonderful um, nutritious addition to soil and you, all you have to do is spread it. You don't have to dig it in. Um, and then grass actually in the summertime in vegetable gardens, if you're mowing your lawn, grass has a ton of nitrogen in it. So for those plants that are leafy greens like this chard you're looking at or for um, the brassicas like the cabbage and broccoli co collards that I mentioned, this is a great addition to using just as a mulch. You don't have to toss it. You don't have to pay for it to be picked up or, um, you know, put throw it away. You can just spread it on your garden. Um, super useful. You want to be careful not to do it too thickly because it can um, sort of mat up. And as it dries, it becomes impenetrable. But also, if it's too thick, it can start to um, decay anaerobically. And then that has a little bit of a smell to it. So you want to avoid that. So here's where you can buy stuff. So again, you're looking at the Omri label on the Cedar Grove potting soil. Um, a lot of people wonder about Cedar Grove because it's coming from all our yards, but they're actually testing. So the, the compost industry has very stringent testing policies and they are certifying organic. Um, so they are testing even more. So you can go to their website and look at their test results. Uh, all that's public information and we can help you find that. You'll see, I think that's the Washington State logo on the bottom as well. Um, so you can buy it in bulk. You can buy it bagged like this. Not all compost comes bagged. So um, Lens um, Enterprises up in Stanwood is the other um, service provider for the city of Seattle. They make a wonderful compost and that's the one that's given away by the city. 
And um, that's only in bulk, unless um, a store, like sometimes I think Sky Nursery has bought it and then bagged it up. Um, but different, um, different companies will do that, but they don't do it themselves. Um, but you can go to garden and hardware stores, um, Cedar Grove, you can buy from, they have different yards where you can go and pick things up in bags or in bulk. And they of course sell all over the region. Pacific Topsoil is a um, bulk type uh, of compost that has multiple yards. Uh, you can um, take yard waste there as well as buy their products. Carpenito Brothers has bulk and bags. <clears throat> Peony Landscape, Burian Bark, um, but also even just Fred Myers, Home Depots and local nurseries. Great places to find bags of compost and soil. So I just want to go through fertilizers briefly because I want to reinforce the idea that if you are using fertilizers, that you're using something that is OMRI listed, ideally, and that also um, is coming from a natural source, not a chemical source, because chemical fertilizers um, disturb the relationship of all of the uh, life in the soil to the plant roots. And so these guys actually help feed um, and nourish them. You're seeing a bunch of different types of things here. Organic and natural doesn't necessarily mean anything. Those are not regulated words, um, but you do see the OMRI label on that Dr. Earth brand. Um, Alaska Fish Fertilizer has sometimes not been on the list. And um, I think, you know, they are testing. It's good to know they're testing these products routinely to make sure that they can still be certified organic, um, but it comes on and off the list sometimes. I think currently, these are older pictures and I think currently it is on um, the organics list. Um, but one of the things I wanna point out is the numbers also on the labels. Those are re referencing nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which they consider the three main um, nutrients plants need. They really need a lot more than that. And most of these fertilizers will have other elements in them as well and um, soil does as well. But those are sort of the backbone. Nitrogen helps growth and green growth and for the photosynthetic process. Um, phosphorus is really good for um, blue, getting uh, flower buds and blooms. And then potassium is important for structure and cell, cell integrity in the plant and root growth. So all three of those are really crucial. And so you'll see low numbers here. Um, what we're seeing 511 for the fish fertilizer is primarily a nitrogen fertilizer. The, um, the kelp meal, you'll see like 0.13 for nitrogen and zero. And then I can't read the other one very well, but these are really minor nutrients um, of the NPK. But if you look at the label for kelp, it has a lot of other things that I was meant, I mentioned plants need other things. So Kelp meal is great for transplant shock or for a plant that's stressed because it has a lot of other things like magnesium and other um, important nutrients. Um, and then on the far right, you see blood meal is at 1200. So you don't want to see any numbers above, uh, you know, higher than 15 usually when you're looking at a natural fertilizer. If you're seeing something like 20, 20, 20, it's usually a chemical fertilizer. So blood meal, this is a single element fertilizer is what this is telling you. It's nitrogen based and um, it's gonna give you that uh, boost to the soil. So again, here's these single element ones. You can get phosphorus as well all by itself. So as you're looking at your soil test, you might find that you don't need phosphorus. Now actually our soils around here can be high in phosphorus. So you can then instead get something like this green sand and this blood meal to mix together to use as a fertilizer and avoid the phosphorus altogether. In fact, lawn fertilizers, you can't have phosphorus in them legally in the state of Washington, unless you are putting a new lawn in and you can prove with the soil test, otherwise prove with the soil test that your lawn needs phosphorus. But our soils are pretty high in it. Both nitrogen and phosphorus, if they run off into the water can cause um, algal blooms and cause problems to our fish and um, which you know goes down the chain and affects everybody else, including the orcas in the Salish Sea out there. Um, here's some other uh, types of fertilizers. Cottonseed meal is often used for plants that are um, 
comfortable in acidic soil. So that's a really good blend for that. Um, dolomite lime is um, lime that ha also has other nutrients in it. So lime is calcium and our soils get low in calcium because we get winter rains that wash it into lower levels in the soil than plant roots can reach. So garden lime can be useful. You can also just get agricultural lime that is just straight calcium as well. And then kelp meal, again, you see those low numbers and this is a powdered version. And this also has the Omri listing on it here. Hey, Laura, uh, yeah. we have a question. Okay. When should I put in plant fertilizer stakes in the ground for fruit trees and evergreen shrubbery? Well, uh, you know, I'm not as familiar with the stakes because typically they're chemical fertilizers, so I don't use them. Um, the label might tell you what, what the idea is. It's early still to fertilize something. It's February. Some things are starting, you know, we have our winter things that start to bloom. Fruit trees will be waking up pretty soon. So I think as soon as with a fruit tree, as soon as you start to see, um, you know, budding on it, um, that would be when you'd want to start fertilizing. For evergreens, I would wait a little bit and let let it warm up a bit. Evergreens are, are um, awake in the winter, so to speak. They slow down, the metabolism sl slows down, but they are actually photosynthesizing all through the winter because they are evergreen, um, but they don't need to be encouraged to grow right now. Anytime you encourage something to grow too early, you know, it's, it's still early February, we could get snow still. We've had snow, in, you know, as late as March um, in this area. And so you don't want to damage that new growth, which could get hurt if the temperatures drop too, too far. Perfect. Thank you, Laura. And we also had another question. I have many conifer trees. Are their leaves and pine cones good for mulch? I have so many pine cones each year and I don't know what to do with them. <laughs> That's a great question. They are. Um, pine cones break down over time. Um, people worry about them being too acidic. They're not. Um, they, they are just a lot of mass, you know, and this is where I say, you know, get to be friends with people who might want to, you know, use your bounty. Um, you can break them up a bit, or you can just, you know, um, bag them and let them sit for a while till, you know, they can break down on their own naturally. Or if there's just too many of them, you know, do put them in the yard uh, waste bin, the curbside bin to be taken to off to be composted because then that can be used there. But Yes, um, like pine needles, they're great for mulch. They, they really do a good job of inhibiting things from growing. So you want to use them in areas where you don't want, you know, to have other things coming up. Like if you're looking to um, have um, like some spring bulbs or um, ephemeral type plants come up, it could, it could be a little too much for areas like that. But in areas where you just have straight shrub beds and tree beds, they're great. If you go to a pine forest, you'll notice there's not a lot of undergrowth in pine forests, not a ton, not like there is in some of the forests that have like, you know, cedars or spruce or Douglas fir, um, because pine can inhibit a little bit more. Any other questions? Let's see. Oh, my chat box went all the way up. Oh, she said, thank you. And um, also our other attendees said, thank you so much. It was a great response. Totally makes sense. I also, I also didn't think about chemical contents. So that's something to consider. Yeah. And, you know, there's so many fertilizers out there. I know it's an easy thing to do because it's, you know, it's this little uh, conveyance tool that you don't have to do much but fertilizers are pretty easy to use so I would encourage people to you know investigate some of these um, natural fertilizers that I'm showing you here because they're better for the soil they're better for soil integrity um, they are actually you know feeding the life in your soil which is what you want to encourage All right, now we're going to talk about the fun job of garden planning, something you can do with a cup of coffee or tea and 
your, you know, your computer or your smartphone. Um, you can use um, a book and jot notes, or you can actually use um, computerized tools. And, and we're going to look at a few of those. I'm a little bit old school. I like the journal, you know, the paper journals. Um, but I do keep a lot of content online and use a lot of online tools as well. So there's tons of garden planning apps. You get, you guarantee you will get overwhelmed with all the different things you could download. Some of them you can pay for, you know, the ones you pay for aren't necessarily better. Um, sometimes they can be, uh, but there's different ways to use these. So you have some like the one you see on the right that can help you sort of visualize the space and help you plan out, you know, what you want to do with it. Um, that can be even as, you know, sophisticated as I want to put a little greenhouse on my property. Or there's ones that are vegetable garden planners that just help you plan out like the square feet of your garden and how many plants you could put in there. And um, we're going to talk about this in a minute, but this, that kind of app can help you think about crop rotation, which is important to keep um, the soil healthy as well. And then you have other apps that can help you sort of plan um, planting schemes for when plants might bloom or have their decorative phase um, and what things can go together, what things have which needs um, in the landscape. So lots of different tools there. If you are a um, techie person, I would encourage you to play with that and just try them. Free apps you know, don't cost you anything. You download them, you try them. If they don't work for you, you delete them off your device and go from there. Some of them are phone friendly, which is nice to know. So if you're primarily using a, a phone to look at things, then you want to know, make sure that that app works well for you and others are best to do on a big screen on a computer. Um, there are some apps that can help identify plants and I've used those pretty successfully, even with pictures on the computer when somebody has sent me a picture that they don't know what it is and I'm a little on the fence about it. And so I'll use the app just to help sort of um, confirm what I'm looking at. Um, and you can, you know, have a little app library. Like with garden books, their apps have different uses. So you could have sort of a little library of them. I have lots and lots of books. And you may be able to see my bookcase behind me. Those are most of my plant books. Um, I have a ton more at my desk at work. And there's different kinds. There's some that are just for identification. There's some that tell me how to take care of things. There's some that, you know, go into more about science of things. And so I use them all in different ways and apps can help you that way as well. Hey, Laura, we had another yeah. question, a really good question. Um, I share a yard with my neighbor who has dogs. Should I be concerned about dog poop in areas that I'm trying to establish in a car? In Establish my garden. I've got some collard greens, hops, artichoke, and flowers so far. Well, you know, dogs aren't as bad as cats in the sense that cats kind of dig up everywhere and bury. So, you know, dog poop you can see and pick up. So if you're on, if people are on top of picking it up, it does leach a bit into the ground, but, you know, it's not that big a deal. You know, it, it, I think um, if you're keeping your uh, garden tended, um, you're watering it, that kind of thing, it shouldn't worry. But you can you can try to like keep them from going around the plants, directly around the plants so that you don't have to worry about it as much. Um, but it's not a huge concern. There's a little more um, toxicology to worry about with cats uh, than there are with dogs. Perfect, thank you. and. She also said, I've wanted to find some good uh, apps for planning, excited for some recommendations. I'm gonna include the Marshall's link um, in the email. Um, is, is the one on the left the same type of program or a different one? No, that's, so that one is more looking at when plants like, you know, when it's showing, it's showing all the seasons. And so you can choose plants based on when they are, you know, going to be blooming or um, more decorative. So this is sort of giving you some ideas about how to choose plants for the garden. Um, and most of these will have, you know, 
information too about well it needs a sunny spot it needs good drainage it needs the shade or or whatever and so you can start to planning um, planting plans based on plants you can gather together and so it's not different from what you'd see in a book that had a lot of plant choices there's a book called right plant right place which um is all right i think i know can you guys see what i'm looking at right now I can't um, tell if you can see me at all. Oh, yeah, there you go, right there. Okay, so Right Plant, Right Place. This book has lists of different plants in it. Um, so it's a similar concept to what you're looking at in that app there. And I don't have a specific recommendation of apps um, because I don't use the apps as much as I use the other techniques I'm going to show you. Um, but I think the apps can be very helpful for people that are learning. Um, I tend to do my drawing by hand, so I like to use pen and paper for when I'm making plans. Um, so I think it's an experimentation. Find out what works for you. Find out what the app can offer you and see if it's helpful um, to you. So there's my method is more journaling. So I do a lot of um, tracking of information. Um, also to help me get ahead of, you know, when I need to do something. When there's is a time coming up when I need to be thinking about, gosh, I got to prune the rhododendrons because they bloomed and I want to prune them before they start to set their flower buds for next year. So I have, I can use a calendar for that. Um, and that can give you, a, um, you know, a heads up that, hey, within this, you know, couple of weeks, you should be thinking about this and you can plan your, your work around that accordingly. It can send you an alert, you know, you can have a little reminder pop up saying it's time to prune the roadies, you know, let's get out there. Um, you can also share information from a calendar and share, you know, appointments. Say you have a family that wants to get involved in working in the yard, you know, you share that appointment with them so that everybody's aware of it. Um, but it, But it's a good way to just sort of keep track of what you need to do as well as when you see things. So, um, like when did the first um, imported cabbage worm butterfly show up in my yard? And these guys lay eggs on your all your brassicas, like broccoli and cabbage, and they chew the heck out of them. And so you want to know they're there. And so if you're journaling every year to show that this insect shows up in April, which for my yard, it's typically um, April, but it could be early to late April, depending on the year. I'm looking for it by the end of March, just to be safe, um, because you don't want them to get too established because um, they will chew the heck out of your plants. Um, so the calendar can help with all of that. Um, and then you can use like something like a WordPress, um, free WordPress site to journal and just, you know, take notes when you work in the garden. What did you see today? Um, you know, date it, um, talk about, um, you know, how plants were doing. Did you start to see black spot on the roses? Uh, did you take care of it? And if you did, how did you do it? So you you can keep notes in a journal on that uh, in that frame, uh, just like you can on paper. Uh, you can make it a private site. You can make it a public site where other people can learn from what you're doing. Um, you can add photos, so you can upload photos of things you saw, um, and. It's a really great way to remind yourself when you go back and go, oh yeah, that happened. I forgot about that. Um, so for instance, a few years ago, we had a big snowstorm in February, you know, and that was, was really deep. And, you know, it is February 4th today and yet it doesn't look like snow, but the other day it felt like it. And we had a little snow in the Delridge area where I live. Um, and, you know, tracking that kind of thing can help you think about how you manage the garden over the years. So from year to year, sort of looking back at the past experiences that you've had. Um, and then I use paper a lot. So I don't, I use paper for my vegetable gardening that I do at my house. I track what plants I planted, what seeds I use, what company it is. Um, even maybe what year the seeds were, because sometimes I have seeds, you know, that I keep over and then I can see if they germinated well or not. Um, I keep varieties of tomatoes that I buy and plant um, so that I can, 
remember which ones did best and which ones were eh, so so and I don't want to buy them again. Um, the nice thing about paper is you can draw pictures. So if you like to draw, this is a great way to actually um, keep track of things. You can, you know, practice your hand at drawing, um, you know, one of your plants in your garden with a, a special bee that's visiting it. You can take photos, you know, and tuck them in as well. Um, it's portable, so you can take it with you out into the garden. You can also take it with you if you're at, um, you know, somewhere else. Like I investigate things that are going on in my sister's yard and she lives across the West Seattle Bridge over in Columbia City. And so it's a little different over there than it is over here. And so I could have a little journal that I keep with me and I can note what I'm finding in her yard. Um, and then you can buy the Write in the Rain notebooks and there may be other manufacturers of these, but these guys are the ones most well known and these are rain resistant. So you can actually write in them when you're outside and it's wet outside. Um, these are all just ways to keep organized. And the reason this is important is that um, you really do wanna know, you know what's going on in your garden. So what worked and what didn't work each year? When did you see the first aphid in the garden? You know, when are they appearing? Um, did you see a lady beetle early? Are they managing the aphids? Um, when are they showing up in your garden? So knowing that can help you plan whether or not you need to intervene if you start to see aphids. If there's not a lot of predatory insects around, the beneficial insects, then you have to perhaps do something like spray a little water on it or squish the aphids with your fingers or you know, use a little um, mild soap spray. Uh, if you're getting a lot of them and there's nobody eating them. Um, you want to know about phenology. So, you know, our, our, our weather has changed some and things bloom at different times. Um, this is important because if pollinators aren't out when your plum tree is blooming, you're not going to get it much fruit at all. So we want to be tracking what, what's happening so that we know and we can you know, choose the kinds of things we're going to grow depending on how well they're going to be productive. Um, but when are things leafing out? When are they going dormant? This year we had a weird fall and a lot of leaves stayed on the trees and I, we had some uh, plants at our Good Shepherd Center Children's Garden, uh, some red stem dogwoods that never dropped their leaves. The leaves just finally froze on the plant. And so there's one of them we actually need we need to take the dead leaves off of it because it didn't drop them naturally. So there's a process that happens with plants where they actually have hormonal changes, which makes the leaf where it connects to the, uh, the leaf stem where it connects to the um, uh, stems of the plant, it makes it break. So it, it, it uh, excises it. But if that doesn't happen properly because the weather isn't, triggering that change in the plant, then it doesn't fall off. And then sometimes it, they happen, or it happens early because of stress. So I, on the other hand, I had a big leaf maple in my neighbor's yard. It was dropping leaves in July, you know, because it was so dry. So different things can happen. It's good to track that <clears throat> so that you know how to take care of things. <clears throat> so again, that unusual weather patterns can, can impact Soil temperature changes through different <clears throat> months. So we're always looking to, excuse me, I'm gonna drink, drink a little bit more. <clears throat> so we're always trying to track temperature, especially for putting vegetables out. If you're a tomato grower, you need to have warm soil, peppers, tomatoes, okra, um, eggplant, squash, cucumber, beans, they all need warmer soil temperatures than the spring plants do. And so it's important to be able to track to know if you can plant. You can do that directly, you know, with a soil thermometer or there's um, there's a Ag WeatherNet site that the um, um, university um, manages, WSU, Washington State, and um, they have a soil map or a map that shows where their weather stations are. And so you can find the one closest to you. For Seattle, there's one, it's over at the Center for Urban Horticulture um, over in the U District, but there's other ones around the area. And so you find the one closest to you 
their Puyallup might be pertinent for more Southern you know, people in South King County. And you can see what the soil temperature is. So you can go, say, oh, gosh, it's 58. I might risk it. But now it's hit 60, so I'm safe to put these things out. Has a lot of other temperature measures, too. But soil is very um, important to know soil temperature. Soil testing information for different garden areas. So, you know, if you do get your soil tested, you can track that. You could test it again next year to see if what you did, if your if your measures uh, of um, trying to help um, made any difference. Um, and again, what what fertilizers are you using? Did you spray something, and when? Um, all of these things. Um, will help you plan and get a better idea of how to take care of your garden. All right, so we're going to talk about choosing plants for a veggie garden. And are there any uh, other questions about planning before we move into the next um, plant choice? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, one of our attendees said that she just got a book from her little library box um, locally in her neighborhood that seems to be a little bit more um, in England-based uh, oh. growing. Um, and then another attendee had a um, great suggestion um, from a local author from Kitsap County, um, Selecting Plants for Pacific Northwest Gardens by Joe Seals. Uh, she said it's amazing. And uh, there is no pictures, but you know, you can, um, go online and uh, search for those. That's great. Thanks for the um, tips for for those. And England, English, English based growing books are actually pretty good for this area because we have a similar climate. Um, and we use a lot of English gardening, you know, knowledge here for sure. And a lot of, especially in the landscape world, a lot of the things that people do here are based on you know, things that are <clears throat> commonly done in England. So that's very uh, common. There's um, tons and tons of books. There's books at the Center for Urban Horticulture at the Elizabeth Miller Library. You can go <clears throat> and check out books there, read books there. Um, tons of information online um, at the Good Shepherd Center. If you're ever up in the Wallingford area, we have a community library in our education room. Um, we don't want people to take books off site, but you're welcome to come and read them and to look through them for reference. So we have lots, lots of books too. But as you, as you can see in my bookcase, I have a ton of different books. I keep a few right next to me that are ones I pick up most often. Um, one of those is about wildlife plants and one is about plants of the Pacific Northwest. That's sort of a, um, just a, a not a guidebook, but a book about um, what's in the Northwest and what I really like about it. This is written by people who, you know, are botanists in the in the Northwest. And what I really like about it is that it even includes things like dandelion, which are part of our landscape now. And so instead of like just trying to be pristine and just talk about native plants, it tells you which things are native, but it also tells you which things are here to stay. And some plants, like a dandelion, though people hate them because they're in their lawn, um, have a lot of useful um, qualities. And they can grow nicely with other things, like in a garden bed. They're, they're not so bad where people really don't like them is in their lawns. But anyway, it's good to have lots of different references. Um, and I have a couple at the end of this one section here. And so you can see in this beautiful veggie garden here, all these beautiful cabbages that are growing. Um, they're surrounded by calendula. There's also some amaranth um, behind them. Um, and what I wanna point out here is that this is a mixture of things on purpose because the more plants you have that attract beneficial insects, the healthier your plants are gonna be. You're gonna attract predators that will um, take care of your pest insects, but also attract pollinators to help pollinate the fruiting plants you have. So when you're talking about picking plants for a veggie garden, you wanna think about the life cycle of the plant. How long is it actually gonna be in that bed? So you may have an annual plant, um, which by definition completes its life cycle in one growing season. And that, that could be two months, or it could be four months or six months, depending on what plant it is. 
So like a tomato, people are going to be starting to plant those soon indoors. And then they get set out in May, May to June. And then they go through all the way to October usually. So that's, you know, a huge light, a huge stretch of months. Um, it's not in the garden the whole time. It's in the garden for the summer. Um, but you may also be growing bok choy, in which case where you plant your tomatoes might be where you do a lot of fast crops, crop, crops of things like bok choy and mustards, because they're going to be out of there very quickly, even lettuce. Um, radishes, things that are fast growing to one to two months um, in life cycle, because then you can use that space again. So this helps you to plan. If you have something like kale, it's going to be there a while. It's biennial. It will bloom in the next year. So if you have kale left over from last year, this year, you'll start to see flowers coming out, usually March, April. Um, and those are edible too, by the way, and delicious, especially collard flowers. They're super sweet and really tasty. But you want to think about that because kale can occupy a long space, or you can just sacrifice it and pull it out so you can put something else in. It's not going to be as productive as it goes further into the year, but it will overwinter and will give you greens through the winter. So it's a useful plant that way. And then you can have perennial plants like apple trees or um, artichokes or um, cardoon or other things, blueberry bushes that take two plus years and may be more permanent in the garden. So things like an artichoke you might have for about three years till it starts to peter out. Um, but an apple tree you could have for your lifetime. So planning accordingly based on how a plant grows. And then to find information about plants, certainly you can you know talk to your nursery people, um, uh, call the garden hotline, talk to master gardeners to find out information about how to plant or how to take care of something. But if you are working with seeds, the beauty of a little seed packet is it tells you everything you need to know. So it tells you when to plant it, what kind of soil it might need, uh, does it need sun or not, um, how long it takes to harvest, how long it takes to germinate. So you know, you know, if this is 10 to 14 days for the cilantro, if in 14 days you don't see anything, you give it a few more days and then maybe it didn't work and you need more seed or fresh seed. And so it'll, it'll help you plan and decide how to keep managing things. Um, I wanna point out that cilantro, people think about cilantro as a hot crop because um, you know we think of using it in salsas and with tomatoes and those hot weather veggies. But in fact, it's a cool season crop. And you'll notice on the packet, even on the front, it says heat tolerant because, and slow to bolt, because it, it is very short. Um, it doesn't take very long to come to, um, to maturity and you want to um, be able to have it in cooler weather. So this is one of the things you can plant out earlier, like in March, and sometimes the soil is a little cool, but it will typically germinate. In, in areas where it's self-seeded by April, it's usually coming up. Um, and it points out to sow every two to three weeks until midsummer. So this is the idea is to just keep um, crops coming. Cilantro is also a really wonderful plant for multiple reasons. So some people don't like the taste of it. I'm not a big fan of the taste of the leaf. I tolerate it in food, but I wouldn't seek it out to plant or to uh, eat. But I plant it because I like the flowers. They attract a lot of pollinators. They attract beneficial insects and they're pretty. It's a small plant. You can kind of scatter it in your veggie garden in a lot of different pockets. And then it also will produce seed, which is coriander, which I love. And then you can let it reseed and it will grow itself again. So it has all those qualities that are really uh, make this little, this little plant very useful. So why do we grow vegetables? Well, we can save money, you know, by having things just growing in our backyard. Um, we can have more choice of varieties. So when you are going to the farmer's market, you might get more choice than when you go to the grocery store, but you still might not see the things that you're intrigued by or interested in, or your favorite type of lettuce or tomato. Um, you know how they were grown. You know what the inputs were. You know what kind of soil you're using, what kind of um, products you might be using, what kind of fertilizers, if you sprayed them, um, and if they are um, clean and healthy for you to, to eat. And then it's just super fun. They, they're fun to grow. It's very satisfying. 
Um, you can see just in this bowl of greens how colorful it is. They're really decorative, a lot of them. You can use them as ornamental plants and eat them. Um, and I do that a lot as well. So we're not gonna belabor this today, um, but you'll have access to this slide deck after the fact, and the recording will be there. Um, crop rotation is important to help prevent diseases in particular in the garden. When you think about, like I'm talking about soils habitat, you have all these critters in there, that can also be the case for bad um, bacteria or bad um, fungi. So these are things that can cause disease in plants because the host plant then becomes the vehicle for the, the organism to live. So things like different tomato blight, the late tomato blight, was, which is a Phytophthora um, disease, it's a root rot disease in a lot of plants, but in this case, it actually is a, is a disease that um, affects the stem, the leaf, the flower, and then the fruit of the plant and can ruin your whole tomato crop. So in order to prevent that, we move them around or we refresh the soil if you have potted plants, because you don't want to create a, a condition that's building habitat for that disease organism to live in. You don't wanna build it at home. And if you keep putting the same um, host plant back into the same environment over and over and over again, that can happen. And it's very prone to happen. And the three families that you see listed here, the tomato, onion, and cabbage families, are the ones in the Northwest that we really think about the most um, because they tend to have more problems. Cabbage can have a thing um, in the root system uh, that will um, create sort of knobby roots. It's, a, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a fungus um, uh, specifically, but it's fungal-like um, creature um, that makes the roots sort of club up. So it's called club root as the common name for the disease. And what it does is kind of close off um, the pathways for water and nutrients to enter the plant. And you'll notice it in the midday when broccoli wilts and the soil is moist and there's no reason for it to be wilting, that's a good clue that there might be a club root issue in the soil. Onions can get root rots and other kinds of fungal diseases too over time and rust on the leaves, which is another disease. So these are things that we wanna be aware of. We wanna move things around um, so that there's not an issue with them over time. Um, and then we talked a little bit about succession planting already. So with the cilantro, Excuse me. Um, I feel like I'm going to sneeze. Um, you can plant things, you know, one week like green beans you see on the right side, and then the next week plant some more. And then you're going to have them coming to maturity a little bit different times. This is a really great technique for lettuce, too. You know, if you ever grow a bed of lettuce and you have two people in your family, you'll discover very quickly that you need to give that lettuce away and give it to the food bank or give it to your friends or family because it's more lettuce than you can eat um, because it's all coming to maturity at the same time. So stagger your plantings a bit. Um, even when you buy plants, you know, buy a six pack of lettuce, put that in. And then, you know, in another week um, when you're at the nursery or the grocery store and you see some more, buy some more or put some seed in at the same time you put those plants in and they'll be younger and coming along behind it. So there's lots of ways to plan um, for this with using your journaling and, you know, making little maps of when things are coming and going, how long it should take to be in the garden. Those seed packets and the plant label will tell you how many days to maturity. So then we have cool season crops and we have warm season crops. And cool season crops are what we're looking at coming up. Um, some things can be planted directly in the soil that can tolerate cooler soil temperatures. You can use those maps um, and so, uh, weather stations that WSU has on their uh, weather agnet page. Um, and then uh, follow that and if it's 40 degrees, you should be able to get some chart out there, um, maybe lettuce. Some things will bolt when it gets too warm. Some things will also bolt when the weather vacillates. So it's really cold and really hot and it will, it will trigger it. it. They'll get confused and it will trigger it to go to seed. And those are particularly true of things like radishes and um, bok choy and the really short season plants. But 
there is, um, I'll show you in a second, but there is a seed chart that can help you plan that out. And then warm season crops need temperatures usually above 50 to 60 degrees is ideal if you can get it there, if, if you can wait till then. Um, there's not enough warm days to grow a plant like a tomato from seed directly in the garden because the soil isn't warm enough early enough. So you start them indoors and then you set them out in May and June at the latest. And by then the soil is warm enough. You can put closures over them. You can use season extension techniques um uh for them as well here's a seed chart and this is on this digital garden tools page that has a lot of other it has that weather uh, map i'm talking about so you can go to this page and read all about the different things you can learn about including the um the maps that are created to show tolerance for plants in different areas so those, there's a USDA map, and then there's the Sunset Western Garden mapping that shows you the different garden zones. Um, but here it tells you, you know, what temperature different seeds need in order to germinate. So there's a minimum temp. So this is where you can sort of push the envelope. The optimum range, you know, can be higher for many things. So like beans can germinate at 60, but they're, they are, you know, they're not gonna do much unless the soil's warm enough they'll rot. Um, whereas beets, you know, 50 to 85 is fine, but you can also get them in at 40 degrees. So you can see there's this, you know, huge range for some of these cool weather plants. They're going to germinate when it's warmer, but also when it's cooler. Uh, again, cucumber 60 degrees. So these are some of the things that you're looking for to understand that some of them um, definitely need warmer temps. Um, down here, 35 for lettuce. So lettuce is very cool tolerant. So these are things, you know, you might even be able to get it into your garden now um, and see what happens. What's going to be the mitigating factor is whether the air is too cold for the little leaves, but you can put little cloches over them. So you can have settings like this. You can have little cutout, you know, bottles. You can have greenhouse, um, little cloches where you have little um, hoop houses, you can have a cold frame. I had a friend at Picardo Pea Patch where I used to garden who built a raised cold frame um, and in the bottom, so this was, would have been higher up off the ground with a few feet of depth and he had filled with soil, but at the bottom of the soil he put fresh manure which generated heat and then he did short um, rooted plants like lettuces like these and so that those plants roots did not reach the manure which would have burned it but stayed in the soil but it warmed that soil and his plants grew huge in the winter time inside this little heated structure that was just done passively like that um, lots of ways to play with that and then these are um, resources that I can recommend the growing food in the city is a good little just basic about you know how to think about um, using space in a garden um, it's applicable even if you have a bigger piece of property because, you know, these are just general um, guidelines um, about our climate and about how to space things and how to um, fit them in. Um, the Maritime Northwest Garden Guide is a Tilth Alliance publication. Seattle Tilth um, created that many, many years ago, and it's a month-by-month planning calendar for year-round gardening, organic gardening, and in particular edible gardening. And so you can look at March and say, what can I plant outside directly? What can I plant indoors? Um, what can I put an outside under a cloche? What can I be harvesting right now? Um, and you can follow that helps helps you with your planning as well. Um, any questions about veggies before we move into the actual landscape plants? Yes, we do have a question. If we use plant starts instead of seeds, are they more tolerant of cold weather? Um, and if so, can they be planted earlier or should we, uh, should should they be planted later? That's a great question. Um, plant starts coming from a nursery might still need to be hardened off. And usually the nursery can tell you that or not. Um, but typically what they're selling you is hardy enough to go out but I don't know that it would be any hardier than a seed you would plant. So for instance, lettuce can tolerate 35 degrees soil temperatures. So if it's warm enough for, for lettuce to be out um, in, the, you know, in the garden bed, 
it should be fine for the seed as well to grow and do what it needs to do. It's just going to be behind, you know, because it's a younger plant. Um, so I would say there's not a lot of difference between that and the, the difference that there would be is that sometimes they're greenhouse grown and not acclimated yet. And so, for instance, we have plant sales at Tilth and we actually are doing a spring plant sale this year in March at the Rainier Beach Urban Farm and Wetland down in the Rainier Beach area. It's a, a farm urban ag site that we co-manage with a um, non-profit group of folks that um, are friends of the organization of the property and um, for that sale you know we are going to have things under cover as we're selling them and our recommendation would be to people is to harden them off a little because they are coming out of the brewer's greenhouses um, and also in May we do a sale at the Good Shepherd Center which has all the summer veggies like tomatoes and peppers and stuff and the same thing we give people the same advice Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Okay, so let's look at some plants for a landscape. And, you know, as we're talking about both of these different things, a vegetable garden versus a landscape, you know, principles are the same. Um, plants are plants, and they all need um, different things. And so the first thing we're looking at when you're choosing plants is, is the right plant for the right place. And this is also true for an edible garden. You're not going to put, you know, something that really doesn't like the beating hot sun in a really hot space um, and expect it to thrive. So we're going to look at that. We're going to look at what plants can do for you in a garden. Um, talk a little bit about aesthetics and then budgeting. You know, like how does that affect? How do you how do you do this? If you're a plant lover. How do you do this without you know like spending all your money on it? So when you're choosing the right plant for the right place, you wanna know the mature size of your plant so you can avoid pruning it. And this is true even of lavender, which can be a big sprawling plant or a big tree. You know, you might buy a tree that's gonna to grow to be hundred feet tall. So you wanna make sure that that's gonna be okay in the, in the yard where you put it. A lot of people over the years, you know, put big plants right up against the um, house. So it can affect the foundation of the house, the root system, or even the branches um, you know, could be um, scra scraping on the house. It could be overhanging the roof and dropping leaves in the gutters and making the roof mossy. It could be um, also just difficult for you to do maintenance on the house because it's too close. So knowing how big a plant is going to get, and that includes how wide is versus how tall, and then what's the root system going to do. Um, it's really important important to avoid pruning if you can. The least amount of pruning you can do, the better, unless you're talking about something like an apple tree and something that you are hedging or you know pruning on purpose. But for most trees that you want to have in your landscape and shrubs, you want them to grow to mature size. So pick the plant that's actually going to get the shape and size that you want. Um, you need to know what your plant needs. Does it need sun or shade or a mixture? Um, what kind of soil does it want? Does it want to drain or does it like a lot of soil moisture? So a blueberry plant, for instance, can grow in a boggy place because it likes soil moisture. Um, it also likes a lot of sun. So you have this combination of needing to have sort of moist soil and then sunny um, exposures. What kind of fertility does it like? Something like a lavender doesn't want to be heavily fertilized. It gets leggy um, and, it, and it isn't as strong. These are plants that um, are native to areas along the Mediterranean on the sea, on the sea shores, up on the hillsides, and it's rocky soil with a lot of sun and a lot of wind. And so they don't need a lot of cod life. Um, but some plants do better with that, and some plants are um, going to be harmed by too much salt air. So knowing all these details can help. And this is why I say all those different plant books are helpful because you can have a plant book that can tell you what a plant needs. Um, versus one that tells you how to prune it, you know, which is a different, completely different topic. Um, plant services. So a lot of plants um, have multiple functions in a garden. You know, we think about we plant the apple tree because we want the fruit, but you can have apple trees that you espalier. You can do this with pears, um, other fruit trees. And this is what we're seeing in this picture on the right, where they've been pruned to be flattened up against 
something and the branches go sideways and they don't come outward. And so there's a lot of manipulative pruning that goes on to maintain this shape, but you this can become then a fence. So you can see a fence in the background, but you can create a fence just using trees like this side by side. And um, they do typically need some sort of structure uh, that helps to hold the branches in place because you are manipulating them to be long sideways and sometimes they get heavy, but pruning can correct that and help that. Um, but a lot of times you'll see little fences behind them where the branches are tied to the fence. If you do that, you need to check that from time to time to make sure that the ties are not cutting into the bark of the tree. Um, this is a really useful tool to create garden spaces and also have this fruit. So now you've like been able to sort of cordon off an area of the garden to be sort of a secret area that's surrounded by apple trees. Um, you can use tr uh, trees and shrubs that have medicinal value where they can be edible like the apple, but you, there's lots and lots of other plants that are edible, have edible um, parts that can be also decorative. And many that we plant as ornamentals that are edible that people don't think about. So for instance, there's a plant um, called cornice moss. It's a dogwood and it has not the big white um, bracts like you see on typical dogwoods, but little tiny yellow ones and yellow flowers. And it produces a shining little red berry um, that's delicious and makes wonderful jam, but it's also a beautiful landscape tree. Uh, things like strawberry trees, the Arbutus unito, which is evergreen, and tends to have flower and fruit on it at the same time. So you'll see the maturing fruit uh, as it's flowering again. Um, it's, it's related to madronas, madrone tree that we have uh, across the Northwest. And so it has a beautiful red bark and evergreen beautiful leaves and these pretty flowers and these interesting round fruits and those are edible as well. And people don't often eat them, but they can be eaten and can be used. And those are the kinds of things you can use to you know, sort of make preserves and things with. Um, there's other plants that are harvested and made into things like rope or trellises. So, you know, you could grow flax, for instance, and use the flax um, to, to make um, string with. Um, you know, it's a process and, and it's something you'd have to be invested in, but there are functionalities to that. You can grow plants like bamboos <clears throat> that are non-running types that won't invade your garden. And you can harvest those to use as um, garden stakes or trellising in the garden. Um, many plants can create windbreaks. So how you position them can um, help keep wind from hitting your house. Uh, we get a lot of winds out of the north, but then also out of the southwest. So you can have things that actually function to break the wind before it hits your house. There are many plants that are good for erosion control. And you can see in this um, picture on the left, um, the mixture of vegetation types can be helpful. You have a tree that's anchoring deeper in the soil and then you have a lot of other shrubby things. All of these things are breaking up the rain as it comes down um, and, and hits, hits the ground so that the raindrops aren't as big. Um, they're more easily absorbed. Uh, there's the rains being dispersed. And then you have this mass of root structure in the soil that's actually helping to uh, hold the soil in place and bring uh, the, rain, the water back into the plants so that there's not as much um, runoff, uh, either from the subsurface soil or from above where you get erosion. So all of that can be helpful. There's tons of different ways around the Northwest that we have landslides. And, how, and knowing about the different plants that can help in different ways is helpful. Um, Washington Department of Ecology has a lot of information on their side about that. Um, trees can also shade a, a home or a garden. So a lot of people, we call them shade trees, these big deciduous trees, uh, because you know we get to sit out under them in the summertime and, and get cool. Uh, so you can use those to your advantage. You can put them places where it's gonna shade the roof, um, you know, as long as it's not too close to the house, but a bigger tree set out into the yard can provide shade at the ho hottest part of the day and it will cool your house quite a bit. I used to live in Northeast Seattle, had a house that had a big maple tree off the corner of it. Um, 
it was always, I was landscaping at the time. So I was out in the field a lot and I come in on, you know, summer day, I was in 85 degrees. It was hot. I was, you know, like exhausted from the heat. And I'd come in, my house would be like 60 degrees and it was, we didn't have air conditioning. It was just that the house, the tree was being shaded, uh, was shading the house. So that helped. Then the tree ended up having a, a rot problem and needed to be cut down. And then the house was hot from then on after in the summertime. So it was, it was tremendous amount of difference from what it can do. Um, it also can keep frost. Plants can keep frost off of things too. So if you have plants in a parking strip um, where you or near a car where you park a car in the winter, you may notice that the side that has the plants on it is going to be frost free compared to um, the other sides of the car uh, that you have to scrape for ice in the winter. That's because trees are transpiring, especially evergreen things. And then wildlife and pollinator support. So we are always trying to make sure that we're picking um, plants that can support wildlife or native birds. And then some of them are pollinators and then also just insects in particular. We have a lot of native bees um, we wanna um, encourage. And there are certain plants that they like better than others. And then there are certain types of um, vegetation that um, different uh, uh, wildlife likes to nest in. So knowing about that is helpful. Oh, hey, Laura, we have a quick question. How do you start sure. the uh, edible dogwood that you had mentioned? It's C-O-R-N-U-S. That's the first word. That's cornus. That's that's the Latin name for dogwoods. And then moss, M-A-S. It's called Cornelian cherry as a common name. And I, I hesitate to use that all the time because it's not a cherry, but it looks like a little tiny cherry kind of with a fruit. It's adorable. I just looked it up. <laughs> yeah, they're, and they're tasty. There's a yellow variety, but they're, the red one is really the one that's the most beautiful. And they're really shiny and jewel-like, um, really, really pretty. And they have kind of a spreading form, and then they have that spring yellow flowering. They're covered in little yellow flowers, really gorgeous. Um, and so that leads to aesthetics, right? Um, you know, I pick plants a lot for their looks. Um, I like that they're functional too, so I, I like to look for that mix of things. Um, but sometimes I just want a tree, you know, because it has this beautiful bark, like what you're seeing here. And I'm, I don't know what this picture was. It's not my picture. Um, it could be Stewardia. It could be, you know, sometimes eucalyptus has different colored bark. I'm, I'm leaning towards Stewardia because of the colors. Um, but if you go through the Arboretum, um, University of Washington uh, Arboretum, uh, there is... Um, the row where all the cherry trees are that you can walk down Azalea Way. And um, there's some cherries down in there that have a very, very shiny red bark um, that's just gorgeous. And the tree itself, the flowers aren't spectacular. They're kind of small um, and, um, you know, it doesn't have as beautiful a form as like a Yoshino cherry or some of the other types that, you know, are, are all, all over the campus itself um, that people go to to look at in the spring. But these, these cherries um, have this most beautiful, shiny, shiny bark. And it's just gorgeous. I'm going to look and see if I can find one to direct you to. Um, but there's so many different plants that have the really gorgeous bark. Um, so here's one, this is a UK guide. I'm gonna visit. Birches, for instance. Um, this is Prunus, they call it the Tibetan cherry, Cerula, can you guys see that? Um, is it at the top of the screen or in the middle? In the middle. Oh, okay, yes. So Prunus cerula, Tibetan cherry, that bark, sometimes this one has some peely areas on it. Sometimes it's really completely smooth. The younger it is, the smoother it is. Just gorgeous um, to look at. And then, of course, I just included cherry blossoms in general because that's sort of a classic 
you know, beautiful flowering tree. But there's a ton of different kinds of flowering trees that you can put in in the, the first springtime flowering. Uh, crab apples are probably a little hardier in this area. Um, and they can be very um, full of flower. A lot of cherries bloom when they don't have leaves on them. Apples can bloom when the leaves are on the tree. So they have a little bit different look, you know, different aesthetic. And then things like echinacea, you can have like fields of perennial flowers. Um, you know, the point here is that everybody has a different feel for what they like. And so one way to sort of figure out what you like is to go around and look at things, go to botanical gardens, go um, even go to nurseries. Remember at nurseries, you're seeing things that aren't mature. So that's not so bad if you're looking at perennials, but be paying attention to, you know, what the ultimate size of the plant would be. You'll see this cute little conifer that actually gets to be hundred feet tall and <laughs> may not work in your yard. Um, but aesthetics matter. They make you happy. They make you want to work on your garden and uh, enjoy it. Um, one of the useful parts I didn't mention was you can pick flowers, right? You can actually cut them and use them as cut flowers in the, in the garden. Things like cherries, um, some flowering plants soon, as their beds are starting to swell, you can trim branches out of it, bring them inside and force them. If they are not far enough along, sometimes a pink cherry will come out white indoors, you know, but it's still pretty. Um, so there's fun ways, like for Scythia, you can force fun ways to sort of bring spring and bring the garden inside as well. All right, so talking about a budget, um, there's lots of plant sales that happen in the Northwest. Um, become familiar with them. The Center for Urban Horticulture Miller Library has um, a calendar where you can just keep track also of all of the garden uh, clubs and, and associations that you can join and become part of. That's another way to get plants is by trading them out with people. Um, you can use Facebook and next door groups that are gardening groups, but you can also join actual garden clubs and associations and share plants that way. But some of the plant sales, like the King Conservation District, um, most conservation districts have a plant sale. So if you're closer to Pierce County than you are to King, you know, and it's easier for you to get down that way, check out the different conservation districts to see. Um, a lot of them have already had their um, plant lists up online, but they typically also have a day where you come to pick up your plants that you pre-ordered that they have other things for sale these days too. They will, this is a good way to get bundles of things. You can get like five in a bundle of, you know, a bunch of red stem dogwood and create, now you have your five plants. They're small, but they're gonna grow fast and you've, you've filled out your bed. You don't have to go to the nursery and buy, you know, $40, five $40 plants. Um, not that you shouldn't also frequent the nurseries, but I think, you know, when you're looking for mass um, purchases, think about things like the conservation districts. Also, the nurseries have bare root sales in the spring. And so they're selling a lot of fruit trees and other deciduous trees that are cheaper because they don't have to invest in the pot and soil and they're bigger. Um, and they adapt well. They are really a good way to plant something in the spring. They grow better than coming out of a pot. So another thing to think about, I mentioned our plant sales, Master Gardeners has sales too. So I know there's um, a lot of Master Gardeners in the Federal Way area. There's lots in uh, Pierce County too. Um, and then all over King County, we have, they'll have a sale at the Bellevue Garden. And then they typically do one at the Center for Urban Horticulture as well. Um, but those are great places to find great plants and good deals. Um, but learn to, how to propagate too. You can make cuttings, like these are all cuttings in this bottom picture. Um, looks kind of like a willow, I'm not sure, but um, really some things are very easy to propagate. You take small pieces of cuttings and you stick them in sand. You can use root tone or you can use willow water, which is a um, triggers the hormonal um, process of growing roots, just like the root tone does. Willow water has salicylic acid um, in it, and that can help um, encourage the plant to grow roots. And so you can take all kinds of trimmings of things out of your yard and start new plants very easily. A lot of plants propagate themselves. So lilac, for instance, will send shoots out coming up, you know, a little ways away from the plant. You can um, dig that up and cut the root, sever the root from the um, uh, main plant 
and then pot it up for a little while to develop a root system and then plant it out somewhere else or share it with a friend. And then um, gathering seed, you can do, you could do it in the wild, but you need to be responsible about that and not rip up plants. Um, just, you know, take a few seeds because we need the seeds to fall back where they are in, you know, wild areas. Um, cooperative seed purchases, though, can be a really good way to get seed. A lettuce, packet of lettuce seed can have a thousand to two thousand seeds in it, which you may not ever plant in a lifetime, right? So they do that. They just give it to you all because it's so prolific. Um, and there is, you know, some ger some will not germinate, but um, you can share seeds like that. And you can go to seed swaps, tilt. Uh, we're having a seed swap on February 25th down at the Rainier Beach Farm. If you guys want to join that, you can look online for that. Um, or on the Garden Hotline Facebook page. I think we put it up um, there. Um, but that's a great way to share seeds with each other. So things you have extra of, you give to somebody else. Um, there are seed libraries around, like the little book, like the little um, library. You guys mentioned the library box earlier. So there are some that people put seeds in, too. You can check those out. Lots of ways to get things and to be creative. All right, I have two more questions for you. And this is also for the chat box. And then I'll take whatever other questions you, you have for me. Um, so how much did today's talk on gardening add to your learning? Did you learn nothing new, some new information, or you learned a great deal? And what do you plan to grow in your garden? And you can select any of these. Um, you can, you, you know, grow a veggie garden, herbs and flowers, flowering shrubs, and, and then trees. So this is just, again, to get a sort of general idea about, you know, what people are doing out there. It helps us. We do a lot of evaluation of our programs. We have to report everything we do back to Seattle Public Utilities, who are our contract managers. And, um, you know, they want to know that we're having impact on y'all when we do these talks. So I'll give you a few minutes for that. And then Elizabeth, you can let me know when that looks good. Perfect. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, for uh, for those of you that might have uh, joined us uh, later in the talk, just want to let you know, um, most of the links that were mentioned here, I've been trying to keep keep track of all the all the good resources. Um, and I've been compiling a uh, template email to send out to everybody. Um, and that will include the uh, resource links. Um, also, in addition, this wonderful presentation in PowerPoint form and uh, some wonderful documents from Garden Hotline that Laura uh, graciously provided to me before the talk. Looks like we have a couple responses here. We'll give you some more time, but uh, also um, if you go to our website and uh, that link will be in the email I'll be sending out, um, you can see all the wonderful presentations that uh, wonderful Laura Matter from Garden Hotline is speaking on this year. So you can um, have something to look forward to when planning your gardens and uh, get some more questions answered by a wonderful expert here. Oh, wonderful, we got some more responses. Let's see. Okay. Gonna wait a little bit longer. And I will also include in the email um, our YouTube channel. And Laura also has a back catalog of classes that she has taught with us. And um we are just very grateful for all of you being here this morning. Okay, perfect. Yay. I'll give you all a little bit more time. Wonderful. Great. Oh, and um, we did have a question. Um, what should we consider with planting trees when our yard slash garden space is sloped? I don't currently have fruit trees, but would like to plant a, a few cherry trees. That would be fine. Um, it, you know, if you have a really steep slope, 
you just have to keep in mind, uh, you know, soil erosion on a steep slope if you're trying to plant something that you need to keep weeded around. Um, but you could, I don't, you know, it depends on your setting. You could have trees and you have, you may have some like, you know, meadow grasses around it, like wildflowers or something on a slope. And um, just keep tree wells trimmed around, you know, clean and mulched around the trees so that they, you aren't, if you're weed eating up in there, for instance, you aren't, you know, hitting the tree trunk. Um, it should be fine though. Um, I don't know. I've seen lots of orchards sort of on slope settings. In fact, Picardo pea patch, the, that one picture I showed you, the original pea patch in the city was um, formed out of the Picardo farm. It was a family, Italian um, farming family up in Wedgwood who used to grow a bunch of stuff in that valley and take it down to the Pike Place Market to sell. And they had orchards on that hillside. So that was all just a sloped orchard there. Oh, wonderful. That's that's really good to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh, and we also had, uh, she had shared that South Seattle College has, has a great little garden center with mon monthly plant sales. So that's good to know. Yes, and yes, thank goodness they've started that up again. So we used to, when we did the compost giveaways, we partnered with them and the ECOS folks who are doing them now are still partnering with them. So some days you'll be able to, I mean, you know, I'm telling you this, even though it's supposed to be a Seattle giveaway, but if you are going to the um, plant sale, typically there's a day in April when they do them in tandem. So you can go get compost and you can go get plants. Um, but yes, that's a wonderful little site. And they're propagating all that stuff there themselves. There's a lot of schools that do that. So horticultural schools, um, some high schools, uh, Nathan Hale, for instance, has a greenhouse and you know that's up in North Seattle for anybody who's up that way. Um, and they, um, they do a big plant sale in the spring as well. Um, so lots of fun ways to find plants. Too many ways to find plants. <laughs> Well, it is great to have many options, right? <laughs> it is. Is everybody done with the questions? I believe so, yes. It looks okay. like. I'm going to try to move to, I think the next slide is just a. <laughs> it doesn't want to move now, of course. Come on now. It was well, so good earlier. <laughs> I know it was good the whole time until now. Yeah. And now it's just, if I click on it, it spins. Well, I think the next slide was just showing who we, you know, our content. Well, I guess. Oh, um, maybe you clicked it twice. Maybe I try the back button. It's okay, I'm just gonna stop the share. It's not an important slide. It's it's just our our information. Um, you know, the hotline should be, um, I think we had the uh, website in one of the, trying to exit, there we go. Uh, um, the website should be in any, some of the literature you get for sure, but it's just um, www.gardenhotline.org. That's simple, easy. And then um, help at gardenhotline.org is our email address. Our phone number um, is 206-633-0224. And then our funders are, um, as I mentioned originally, um, the Seattle Public Utilities who administers the contract, the Hazardous Waste Manager Program in King County, the RainWise Program, which is a Seattle King County program, but is Seattle based. It's about the basins in the city of Seattle. It's a rebate program, and then uh, Cascade Water Alliance, which is out, you know, different compendium of of groups in the uh, county. And so all of these guys pay us to come out and talk to you and uh, spread the good cheer of how to do natural yard care um, to protect our resources, reduce pesticides. And we are so grateful for uh, you and all these wonderful resources that. 
are available to the community. Get everyone in their gardens. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's early, but it's still time. Things are happening. My rosemary's blooming. The hummingbirds love the rosemary in the winter, which is wonderful. Um, and then there's a lot of winter things already blooming. So witch hazels are already in full bloom. And again, if you if you aren't in the Seattle area, I would I would recommend coming to the Center for I mean to the Arboretum UW um, Botanical Gardens, the Arboretum. They have um, a winter garden area that's spectacular. So it has things that are in bloom now, but also things that are beautiful bark. So it gives you a when you're talking about aesthetics, it gives you ideas of things to put in the garden that are really beautiful. And then a lot of those are good wildlife plants as well. A lot of anything shrubby is good for wildlife, especially birds, because it gives them cover. Um, but it just gives you some perspective on, you know, heaths and heathers and um, hellebores and different witch hazel trees and red stem dogwoods and um, some willow and things that are really um, beautiful in a winter setting. Yay. Thank you. Yeah, and we have a uh, we have a couple of uh people in the chat uh planning to do raised vegetable gardens and flowers, always trying to attract beneficial insects. And um I know that you had shared with me a wonderful handout. So that'll be in the email. Uh, there's a lot of great additional information that Laura shared with me before the presentation. And uh, you'll also get a copy of the PowerPoint, which is really great. So you can look back upon this. And um, looks like, let's see, uh, took notes, the fertilizer tips, um, doing the bottom layer in the cold frame for that free heat. Yeah, that's a great tip that your friend did and um, oh it's it, fabulous it was so beautiful you know dead of winter he has these gorgeous lettuce plants inside of it it's so amazing create um using using the earth and science to still have fresh lettuce in the winter i know it's, it was beautiful oh, that's wonderful and there's a yeah. lot of thank yous and oh um, thank you for all the information. Very helpful and informative. I plan to go out and mulch on shop wheat that's been growing everywhere in hopes of slowing it down. I've already removed a lot. Yeah, just the season. They, these guys like cool weather, um, like their cousins, broccoli and all those guys that can winter over here. They're early birds in the garden. So they're going to be everywhere. One little plant can throw out hundreds of seeds. So you can get thousands of seed, seedlings if you have a stand of those weeds. But also you can eat them. Remember, they're not that bad. I mean, people people get a little hesitant about that, but it's just like eating, you know, um, leaves of collards. You know, it's not any different. So there you go, folks. Give it a shot. If you like <laughs> it. <laughs> And Elizabeth, are you going to save the chat for me as well so I can track my questions today? Oh, yes, definitely. And I, um, yeah, so all of it will be uh, in, in an email to you. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay. Yeah, so we have this afternoon, we have a meeting with our team, our whole team of staff and our, we have a couple of interns that work with our master composter program. And we also have five different subcontractors that we work with who do a variety of things like help us with photography and videos, social media, um, uh, promotion of the hotline, and then people who speak other languages who work with us and with groups who have other language um, capacity. And so we were all meeting today. We were gonna do an in-person meeting, but several people got sick, so we switched it to online. So this afternoon, I'll be ha we'll be having our grand get together with the whole team. Um, so if you do call the hotline this afternoon between two, twelve thirty and two thirty, nobody will be answering the phone. Just so you know, because <laughs> the whole team will be in the meeting. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's amazing that um, any other time there is that resource for everyone here in the community, and um, it's really wonderful that um all all that you do and all that garden hotline does the tills alliance 
um, creating um, a better earth for everyone. There are, you know, to go to the Tilth Alliance site too, there's lots of classes that we teach that are fee-based. Um, there are some scholarships for those too, um, but those are taught by our community education team, really fabulous educators, both in the um, South End at the Rainier Beach Farm and up in um, Wallingford, but they're gonna be doing some classes out in Kirkland this year too at the McAuliffe Park. Uh, so we'll have more things on the East side. Perfect. Yay. So I will include the uh, Tilt Alliance link in the email to everybody. I already got Thank that you. set up. Yay. Thank you. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you so much, Laura. And do we have any other questions for our wonderful expert? Your presentation was just fabulous. I learned so much. Good. Feel free to enter in the chat box if you're shy. Oh yeah, also what will be included in the email will be uh, our uh, website with all the rest of the classes with Laura here this 2023 year. Just want to make sure I mention that. And so you can have um, some wonderful more gardening classes to look forward to. And Elizabeth, what did we choose for March? I can't remember now. Oh, yes. Um, it's for uh, April 1st. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, we, we are advertising in the March newsletter since it is at the beginning of uh, April. We wanted to give uh, more time for advertising, but uh, that one's going to be preparing for the edible garden for spring. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so we'll go one. into a lot more depth about details about um, soils and and um, plant choices and um, preparing um, things, and then preparing for prevention of problems. Oh, yay! prevention and the power of knowledge for some edible garden goodness. <laughs> oh, one of our attendees said, I really appreciate you all offering this class for free. Yay. Yay. Yes, well, it's wonderful that Marlene's offers this venue. Um, you know, the hotline being a free service, a lot of people don't know we exist even, and we are free for, you know, to, you know, technically residents of King County, but we talk to people from all over the world. When I'm doing reporting on where the zip codes are coming in from, we, you know, we've talked to people in Africa, in China, and across the United States, Florida, New York, and the Carolinas seem to be, and then the Chicago area seem to be sort of our big hot spots for other parts of this uh, country. Uh, we talked to people in Canada. We've talked to somebody down in um, Buenos Aires. Um, yeah, so people find us online and call us anyway. So we don't turn people away, certainly. But it's wonderful that King County and Seattle um, offer this resource to people to, you know, for people to learn. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. And we are so appreciative and and super grateful for you, Laura and your knowledge, you have so much knowledge to share and it's always an honor to work with you. Thank you. And thank you everybody for being here. We, um, oh, wonderful. Uh, thank you for this meaningful event. I am, I'm glad I found this event on Facebook. Wonderful. One of our attendees said, yay. Well, I am just so grateful you found it too and for being here and participating. And definitely check out our website for that April 1st class on the uh, edible gardens. And I hope all of you have a wonderful weekend. Take good care.